My name is Julia Lovell. I'm Professor of Modern China at Birkbeck University of London and with the head of the Chinese department at the British Museum, Jessica Harrison Hall, we put together the exhibition China's Hidden Century, currently showing at the British Museum. Welcome to this discussion event, a bridge to modern China, talking about how the themes that the uh, uh, period of the exhibition covers uh, link to concerns and developments in modern and contemporary China. The exhibition focuses on what we've called China's long 19th century, the last hundred some years of the final dynasty to rule China, the Qing. The material covered by the exhibition stretches from the abdication of the Qianlong Emperor and accession of the Jiaqing Emperor in 1796 through to the collapse of the dynasty and abdication of the final child emperor Pu Yi in 1912 amid China's first revolution which makes way for a republic. Our guest speakers uh, for this event, Professor Derbin Ma from the University of Oxford and Professor Hu Ying from the University of California at Irvine are both going to talk about important developments of China's long 19th century that can be seen as trailblazing and foreshadowing challenges and achievements that have shaped China since. Our two guest speakers are each going to speak for about 20 minutes, uh, Professor Ma on developments in the economy of late imperial China, and Professor Hu on changing ideas about the role and education of women. And at the end, I'm going to bring our two experts into conversation about some of the ideas and themes raised. Before I hand over to uh, Professors Ma and Hu, I'm going to outline some of the features of the 19th century that make this period so important for understanding how, where, and why China develops since. I don't have time to go into a lot of detail on historical context and background here, but if you want a longer overview of the key coordinates of China's long 19th century to help you navigate the period, take a look at the curator's introduction to the exhibition China's Hidden Century, available on YouTube, as you see in this slide here, where, amongst other things, I, prov I provide that overview. Now, it'll be immediately obvious, though, that the chronological bookends that we chose for the exhibition coincide with major historical processes or moments of change. 1796 and the abdication of the Qianlong Emperor are seen as the end of what some call the High Qing, so a period of huge political and cultural self-confidence. They're also seen as the beginning of a period of protracted crisis and transformation. So in 1912, the last emperor Pu Yi stepped down, bringing some 2000 years of dynastic rule to an end. And in the exhibition, we try to argue that although this was a time of profound turbulence and crisis for the Qing Empire and for China, this was also a time of innovation, resilience and extraordinary transformations and a period that in many ways bridges to the concerns and characteristics of China's 20th and 21st centuries. Of course, we can see how this uh, proposition might hold on the most basic level of political change. So between 1796 and 1912, China moves from being an empire ruled by the emperors of a single family or dynasty, the Qing dynasty, to being a modern republic. And here's a quick timeline of the Qing dynasty for you to hold in mind. The technologies that are modernizing and transforming countries like Victorian Britain reach China too in the Qing Empire's 19th century. Railways, steamships, photography, electricity. Modern newspapers begin in China, bringing remote parts of China in instant contact not only with each other, but also with the rest of the globe. 
Chinese people are traveling more than ever before, both within and far beyond China. People are learning about and using things designed, invented, made all over the world. So medicines, vehicles, clothes and food. By the start of the 20th century, you've got a national network of schools. You've got quickly growing cities. People are questioning old rules, old hierarchies. They're talking about the need for democracy. You've got a women's movement, women becoming revolutionaries, taking a role in national politics. This is a period when globalization in both negative and positive elements begins to have a massive direct impact on lived experience in China. Of course, the Chinese empire had long been in contact with other parts of the world, many technologies, objects and ideas had traveled into China from India and Central Asia over preceding millennia, uh, metallurgy, plants, um, religious systems like Buddhism and so on. And Chinese ideas and objects had traveled in the opposite direction. By the early modern period, the Ming Chinese Empire was at the center of the global luxuries trade, a, a position the country maintained until deep into the 19th century, at least. But global forces had an unprecedentedly direct transformational impact on China in the 19th century. In 1840, Qing China fought its first war with a Western nation, the first opium war with Great Britain. And this was the curtain raiser on about seven decades of bruising, violent collisions with foreign nation states, first Western, Western nation states and later Japan. This eroded Qing sovereignty. It made China's frontiers fundamentally more porous, more open to foreign influences and forces. Ideas about international law and politics changed government and debates about representation and participation. New scientific ideas and techniques changed industry, armies, medicine and consumption. Newspaper headlines these days speculate a good deal about China's global role and ambitions in the present and future. This all important concept of China as a global player with all the challenges, possibilities, conflicts and uncertainties that this may bring began in the 19th century. So many of the key questions for China with regard to an international order that then and still just about now is Western dominated. So many of these questions began with the arrival of globalization in the 19th century. These questions include uh, how should Qing China, uh, so used to a position of regional dominance, deal with and stand up to self-confident, assertive empire building nation states in Europe and the US and Japan? How should traditional older cultural practices respond to and absorb new ideas, technologies, objects, people and fashions from outside Qing China? But of course, far from everything that went on in China's 19th century was about China's relationship with the world beyond its borders. There were many issues that had ramifications above all for life within China. In addition to the turmoil brought on by the impact of foreign imperialisms, Qing China was undergoing a series of crises brought on by internal factors, factors like environmental exhaustion, overpopulation, a government that was too small to resolve these social and economic challenges. And these challenges remain profoundly relevant for China today. Some are political, for example, how do modern technologies, education and media create a sense of loyalty and belonging to a central state? How, with the onset of technical and material modernity, do you build new institutions that generate a sense of political community that is consensual and participatory, as well as backed by law? How do you mend an environment exhausted by population growth and booming consumer demand? How does a government create a sense of unitary national community out of a landmass that is, at heart, a multi-ethnic empire? Historians have long identified the 10 or 20 years of the early Republic, so I'm talking here about the 1910s through to 1930s, as the crucible of Chinese transformation and modernization. So this is seen, this has long been seen as the time when the politics, culture and society of China became mobilized into a modern Republican nation. But many of the standout changes associated with this period began in the late Qing. 
for example, the shift towards the vernacular as the language of publishing and education. Uh, exposure to and voracious consumption of global news and culture, arguments about feminist emancipation and ethnic autonomy, and a new understanding of China not as a world in itself, but as a nation in the world. So the exhibition, China's Hidden Century, treats the experiences of 19th century China as an essential bridge to 20th and 21st century China. It's a period when China is dragged violently into a Western dominated world order, when politics, culture and everyday life are opened up to global influences and exchanges with a new intensity. When people are debating new political ideas and ways, are governing, ways of governing the country, norms in culture, economy, politics and society are being challenged, added to and remade. That brief introduction complete, I'm now going to hand over to Professor Durbin Ma to discuss aspects of the economic history of China's long 19th century. Professor Ma is Professor of Economic History at the University of Oxford and a Fellow of All Souls College. His wide ranging expertise includes a focus on the East Asian and Chinese economies. His many publications include the Cambridge Economic History of China. Welcome, Professor Ma, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Julian Lovell. And this is a great privilege to be able to uh, participate in this activity. Uh, I have been long a beneficiary of the British Museum and the various exhibitions, and this is a really wonderful exhibition. So I, I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity to be able to share some of my research, hopefully connecting with uh, the exhibition and some the introduction that was done by, uh, by Professor Level earlier. And link with uh, what Professor Hui will be talking about, the women's education. Um, so let me uh, start get started right away to, in some sense, I'm, I'm a trained as an economic historian. So there will be, I think I was also asked to talk a lot more about the economic history side of things. And I think one of the very important elements is the 19th century, uh, people would think of a stagnant, but this is really a bridge to modern China. And that's something very, very important. So I will be talking a lot about certainly late 19th century, but early 20th century, and to some degree, even what's happening today. Okay, so let me get started. One thing about the, uh, you know, this is a rough structure, that's quite a lot of, lot of material. And um, but hopefully I will cover it with uh, something much more, uh, do a lot of pictures, images, and and so on. And most of I just realized, uh, you know, I will mention that later, my pictures and images are mostly full of men. So this is great that uh, Professor Huyin will be concentrating on the role of women. And um, so these are the uh, different things I'll be uh, covering through. Um, so first of all, as a symbol, and I think, you know, I still remember probably reading Professor Julian Lovell's uh, book on the Opium War and so on. So many of the things people talk about is this symbol. This is the ruins of the Yuan Mingyan Garden in Beijing. This is the Imperial Garden that was burned down by the um, during the Second World War by the French and possibly the British troops as well. Uh, the remains were there, were standing. They were a symbol of Western imperialism and Chinese humiliation. So it's something that was very, very important to remember. It was ironic, you can see, the, uh, the architecture, the, the ruins were very Western. So it was actually garden uh, designed and built by the Italian architects in the 18th century for the pleasure of the uh, of the Qing emperor. But whatever it is, they, re they remained uh, the really the symbol of Chinese uh, humiliation to come. So this is sometimes how people think about the 19th century. And this is what sometimes people talk about even today, the so-called Chinese dream or Chinese rejuvenation. So let me go very, very quickly on the macro statistics. There's the idea, you can see very quickly, the 19th century, China was falling, right? So this is a little bit of conventional statistics. And Britain with rapid industrialization was, was, was ahead of China even before that, but with industrialization even going faster. Okay, but the story doesn't end there because the Opium War happened in, 1842, and China was forced open roughly for 1840s, 1850s afterward. There was another country that was facing similar kind of situation. So we are able to put these, what we call per capita GDP statistics together. And we are seeing here, it's very strikingly, 
that Japan has been rising all the way, which was another country that went from nearly being colonized to becoming a colonizer. And, you know, one of the places they colonize the parts of China, as we will see later on, that will have a huge impact. You can see Japanese per capita GDP is rising consistently where China was relatively stagnant throughout this whole period. Now, this particular stagnation is in some way not very fair. This is something I talked about quite often, because if you, part of it, the Chinese as a country was so big, was about you know, 400, 300, 400 million people. That was really the largest the country the world has ever seen at the time. Uh, on the other hand, that you see really the impact was come in as um, the introduction pointed out, that modern firms began to rise. In the beginning, these foreign banks still come in, but certainly by the 1890s, when China was defeated by Japan, then you can see the rise of Chinese banks, particularly Chinese firms, but particularly modern Chinese banks, which we will see as the rise of modern finance. So this is something really, really quite important. China was a very important empire, but certainly by the early 20th century, it was on its course to become a modern, uh, modern country. And you can see from, this is the data we have 1912 onwards, the industrial, uh, modern industrial production was expanding at something like 8% per year. That's very, very high. As people tend to forget that, there's a very rapid expansion. And very importantly, modern universities, all the major modern universities we see today is founded roughly after 1900, 1910s, okay? So this is also a very, very major, major uh, development uh, as well. And these are the statistics. Now I want to illustrate in particular one case and this is, of course, many people have paid attention to is the city of Shanghai. Okay. And, and it, the rest of it looks like I'm, I'm doing some tourism advertising for my home city, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's quite, uh, quite important. So this is the roughly, you can see a little circle and a circle today called the Reming Road. And uh, that was the old wall. The wall was taken down uh, around the same time, I think the city of London war was taken down the earlier earlier 20th century, maybe before 1910s. This is quite amusing. It's a it's a very very small area, you know. It's it's almost like a square mile, and that's what the original Shanghai was like. And it was interesting. And now that area was a touristy place in Shanghai. This is all these buildings there. These are completely fake, uh, but whatever it is, they they make very good use for tourism. This is what original Shanghai was like. That, that's what I want to point out to you. When you look at the stagnancy of Chinese overall Chinese GDP, but then you look at a city like Shanghai, it's completely transformed. A place like this was turned into what we uh, will know is, now this is the old city. Remember the old little circle? That's what it was. So the city grew outside, in particular, the international settlement and the French concession. Okay, and That became something, the key in many ways to finance, to intellectual development, we see the modern Communist Party was born in there as well, okay? And this is the one of the most interesting part, this international settlement. And the international settlement is composed of 11, 13 country, and it, they ran the Shanghai Municipal Council. It was run in the form of, of a corporation. And so they have lofty names, the different national flags and all of that. But in particular, most interesting, they call the place Gong Bu Ju, uh, which is using the Qing minister's name. So they were actually trying to, even the, even for the federal foreigners who are staying here, they say, we are here to stay. We are actually, to a certain degree, a Chinese institution. Okay. So I want to show you what they have done. And it's all in unintended consequences. These are not people trying to develop China. Uh, they are, uh, to a certain degree, selfish business people, very large businesses. You know, HSBC is one of the things that grew out of it. This is the Shanghai Bund that came out of it. That's, that was the Shanghai's real financial district, okay? And you could see that's probably, you know, the custom house, the Bank of China. Bank of China at that time was actually a Chinese bank, which I will talk about a little bit later on, okay? Now, I want to show you the impact of this Shanghai to a certain degree. This is the old building in the 1980s. And I'll show you this important uh, Southern tour by Deng Xiaoping in 1992. This is several years after you know the Tiananmen Square incident, and China was was going back into conservative mood. 1992, Deng Xiaoping came out and said, "We all need to go reform." Now, one thing he did, he went to Shanghai and visit this. He was looking at these buildings. This is a financial architecture, financial infrastructure left in a colonial area. 
why can't we build a new financial district? He was looking at an area in Pudong uh, across the river. And exactly, that's exactly what happened, that this is the new Pudong financial district. And it's remarkable how this becomes such an image that, you know, the old, uh, the legacy of, uh, of Shanghai still played at this very, very important role. Okay, so that's the part of urbanization and the important role of city. And the thing I want to talk about is the role of the Westerners is always being very, very tricky. As I showed you, the Yuan the ruins, right? That was the that was evil doing. And to a certain degree, there is certainly that aspect of it. But the, the story is much more complicated. One, one person and one organization that played a very important in the maritime custom, Hai Guan, and people think, you know, I won't have time to go into the detail into this. It was headed by Robert Hart, who is probably one of the very important uh, person in China. He was knighted. He was a he was a, a, a Protestant Irishman, and he was knighted. He was also given rank three by the Chinese emperor. So he was actually part of the Chinese organization. Maritime custom became a sometimes people call China's first modern civil service, and it's closely connected to the rise of modern finance. It has to do with the, the, the rise of government bonds and modern banking, which I will show you very, very, very quickly. By the way, um, you know this is um, Robert Hart in green, and Maritime Customs also runs the post office. The post office was green, and it might be the Irish color, so a lot of people didn't realize uh, in that when you go to China, you see the post office today was in green. Okay. So why was maritime custom so important? Because it was, it was collecting tax revenues. These tax revenue were actually as part of the, sometimes you could call it Western imperial control. These custom revenues were used as collateral for financing. First of all, foreign debt, China, Chinese borrowing to the, from foreigners laid on Chinese domestic debt. So in 19, this is a 1914, China issued its first domestic debt this is very, very remarkable. We show you that this is actually modeled completely off of modern uh, financial uh, government debt before. You know, this is something in some sense quite revolutionary uh, that really, really stayed. Uh, this is something that has been, this is the, uh, over time people talk about the rise of the government debts in China. So this is the first time in the early 20th century, Chinese government, you know, after, certainly after 1911, was beginning to use this very, very tool, modern tool they borrowed from the West is the issue of government debt as part of the fiscal capacity. And so we have now very systematic statistics about how government using the debts to, to illustrate that. What was the most important, I want to talk about that, to some degree, you can think about the, the modern banking rose in Shanghai had to do with Western colonial banking, right? The most important is what we today still see the legacy that is etched. HSBC, many people didn't realize the full name of HSBC, it's Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation, is incorporated in, in Hong Kong using the British common law. I mean, corporation was very rare at the time, but its major activity was actually uh, in Shanghai. And it was a spin-off of the Actin Matheson Company, which is a Scottish uh, um, trading firm, and it traded in opium and all, all the other things. But the HSBC is modeled after the Scottish free banking system. And later on, Chinese government banks, particularly Bank of China, took over HSBC's charter as a model. And that's where all things started. And one of the very interesting things, slowly the modern Chinese bank was, was being privatized by a group of modern bankers who largely studied in the West. This is the, a photo of Zhang Jiaohao, who uh, studied in Japan in, in Keio University. I returned to China, you know, I think became the vice president of bank at age I, 28 or something. It was a remarkable personality to a certain degree. And he was slowly making the Chinese banking sector much more independent. That is, he get a private shareholder into the, uh, into the bank, uh, banking system. And many ways started what we call in the 1910s, 1920s, the China's golden area of free banking which means all the banks are issuing currencies that are credible. And the Bank of China was beginning to take over the issuance or the, um, of the government debt, which was before them through HSBC. So this is an aspect that I think is very, very important, Chinese ability, not, not only just to imitate, but also to overtake and compete and also cooperate with the Western banks. 
Okay, and you can see, by the way, that the element today, when you, when you visit Hong Kong, you see the three major banks are issuing uh, uh, paper currency as well. Okay, let me go through this very quickly. Bond prices will be issued, which means there's a secondary market, large amount of currency reform that was really going on, and paper money that was being uh, issued in a very, very large degree. And this is, of course, the most remarkable thing. Remember, stagnant GDP, but Chinese money really grow. Okay, this is the Chinese monetary growth, which is very, very remarkable, okay, under that system. So this is really very, very modern, big modern transformation, okay. Um, so I'm having said all of these things that probably centered on some of the treaty ports. I want to go back to the very important things about revolution and, and the political change, you know, in the remaining uh, minutes that I have. And I want to, to some degree, go back to the hinterland again or the connection between the hinterland and the coastal areas. Now, I think, you know, Professor Lovell's introduction already talked about the Taiping Rebellion, uh, which, you know, uh, to some degree was influenced by the West, but of course it was uh, it was completely confused and so on. And in, in the beginning, people, uh, the, the Western missionaries were excited that this is a Christian revolution coming into China, but it turned out that was not the case and so on. Uh, what, it, what we all know what happened is it lost a massive amount of destruction in China's richest area. But most important aspect of it, that's something that has a very large impact on the political side of it, is the Taiping Rebellion eventually was not repressed, was not suppressed by the Qing government, who were actually completely powerless. They were suppressed by a, a elites in Hunan province, which is the most conservative, most closed down provinces in China. And these elites, particularly with Zheng Guofan, who was the highest you know, civil service examination candidates, used their own financing, raised their people from the lineage, and uh, used modern weapons and beat uh, the, uh, the Taiping Rebellion. Now, the point that I want to emphasize is that for the next half a century, the Hunan and later on Huizhou elites, uh, sorry, Anhui elites dominated the Chinese political scene. And this is something that is becoming something very, very important, and including the reform. Okay. So uh, the Hunan elites engineered something called the self strengthening movement, which is relatively conservative. And I want to say a little bit about at that time the comparison with Japan, because Japan was beginning to play an increasingly large role. And Li Hongzhang was the second person in the photo that we have seen here, the, the one in the middle. And uh, he had a very interesting conversation with a Japanese bureaucrat. And that conversation in some sense was very, very illustrative. Li Hongzhang was admiring Jap Japanese reform, uh, which was basically trying to copy the West. But he said, one thing I don't like, you people have taken the Western dress. Do you have to do that? You know, we Chinese still keep our Western dress. And it's very interesting that Japanese bureaucrat was saying, well, we took a Chinese dress earlier because that was something very, very advanced. Now we took something that we consider very, very advanced. But the Japanese bureaucrat made a very interesting remark. But remember, you took your hairstyle from the Manchus, which wasn't really yours. So this is something that is talking about the complexity of the Chinese political. So remember, all these Hunan elites are actually Han Chinese. Okay. So there's a photo of them and look at the dress in, in, in the, the contract dress style. Now, what I want to emphasize, the Chap Japanese reform ended up being extremely thorough. They are, it's a complete Western nation. And then they defeated uh, China in the Sino-Japanese War, first Sino-Japanese, 1894. They signed the Treaty of Shimonesuke. This man that was a little bit stooped is Li Hongzhang. Okay, the person who had the conversation. And look at all the Japanese, they are dressed in Western military star clothes. Of course, this is a cartoon and so on. And this is something really, really showing. And that led to the collapse of the relative conservative movement, led to the reform at the end of the century. Okay, so let me go through that very quickly. And the reform started in Hunan. Okay, I won't go into much greater details. The most famous character, which also is shown in the exhibition, is someone like Kong Youwei. Okay, Kong Youwei is Calligraphy was displayed there. Kong Yui, Liang Qizhao, and Huang Zhenxian, all these people come from Guangdong province because they had exposure of the West. But it's very interesting, they went to Hunan to launch the reform, right? Because that's where the real power is. So Chen Baozhen and also Tan Sitong. And so these are the forces began to get together and have a Japanese style reform. Now, Chinese revolutionary eventually converged and this is the most unusual part, 
in Japan. In Japan is where two groups of people met. A lot of people forgot Huang Xing, who is from Hunan. And in, who in, in Japan, they, they met, he particularly met Sun Zhongshan, who has been launching revolution from Guangdong from outside China for a long, long time. And also later Jiang Jiesi, who was of course the most important leader. And Jiang Jiesi was doing a degree actually in Japan and Sun Zhongshan has spent a long, long time in Japan. And eventually, you know, this is also where Sun Zhongshan met his future wife, the Song sisters, and Jiang Jiesi married one of the Song sisters as well. The Song sisters was coming from Shanghai. Now you can see the Song, the Shanghai elites really come into the picture. And Song sister had one thing in common. They all actually graduated from the US. They are Christians, right? So you can see there's that merging that was really, really begin to come in. Okay, that's why we see the modern China coming. So I'm almost getting to the end of it. You can see in this, you know, the, the 19th century, although you can see that, you know, you could see there was a lot of struggle, there might be uh, stagnation and so on, but it laid a very, very important foundation. The foundation is to some degree launched from the West, from the coastal area. However, they will not work if they do not connect with the internal Chinese forces. It was Kong Yue, Liang Qitao, those people who internalized Western ideology and began to connect with the power, but at that time based in the Hunan, uh, in the Hunan province. And that power was started from Zheng Guofan, okay, the, the one who suppressed the Titan Rebellion. I want to end by pointing out, I mean, these characters, these two personalities, they will not put them together. Uh, Mao Zedong was a very young Hunanese who was, he was born and grew up in the very revolutionary spirit of Hunan, okay? And we all know for a long, long time, the Hunan elites played a very, very important role. And Mao Zedong was one of those personalities. Now, remember the Deng Xiaoping Southern Tour 1992 that marked the most important uh, reform? The person really who carried out the reform, of course, there's Jiang Zemin and, and all others. Zhu Rongji was a major figure who carried out the most radical reform after 1922. He was first the mayor of Shanghai, and then he became the premier of, of China, only you know, for one term. And a lot of people connected Hu Zhu Rongji as someone coming from Shanghai, but actually not. But not. He was a Hunan uh, native uh, personality. He was known for being extremely outspoken, very, very forward. That probably really brought the, uh, the 20 years of economic boom after the 1992. That's where we see uh, China today. So let me end there and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Ma, for that fascinating and thought provoking presentation, sort of really underlining the forces of the late imperial period that foreshadow uh, events of the 20th and 21st centuries. I'll have some specific questions for you later, but first I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Professor Hu Ying is Professor in East Asian Studies at the University of California at Irvine. She has a particular interest in modern Chinese literature and culture and has published widely on, amongst many subjects, female writers and political participation in the late Qing through to the Republican period. Professor Hu Ying, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Lavaux. I'm honored and excited to participate in this panel in conjunction with the wonderful exhibit at the British Museum. I've seen on social media enthusiastic responses to the exhibit and hope I'll be able to make it to Britain in the summer to see it. So the 19th century is long and contains multitudes. At its beginning, we have the glorious days of the Hai Qing, one of the cultural high points of traditional China. At the end of the century, the last dynasty was finished and China was, the, was on the cusp of modernity. So on the subject of women, 19th century also saw radical changes. And here are the questions, uh, some basic questions that I will address today. So who is the traditional Chinese woman? How did the new woman come about? That would happen in the early decades of the 20th century. And what is the connection between women or women and China? Along the way, I will highlight the stories of a few notable women. <music> 
So I'll start with the mythic figure. We find her in history books and school texts. On the face of it, this is not untrue, but it doesn't tell the whole story. That this simplified image dominated people's imagination is largely owing to the powerful narrative propagated at the end of the 19th century. So one of the powerful um, voices was Yang J. Allen, who first linked the status of women directly with the nation. So he says, we employ the status of women and their treatment in every country as a yardstick for judging the degree of civilization of each culture. Readers will be able to assess the true place of the Chinese civilization themselves. This is in the preface of his book, A Survey of Female Customs in the Five Continents. Ellen was an American Methodist missionary, influential in the field of education, including women's education. He published newspapers, magazines, and books as a form of both. He was very influential among Chinese reformers of the time, including the young reformer, the trend setter, Liang Qichao, who said, when I try to deduce the underlying reason for the weakness of a nation, it always starts with the lack of education for women. Now, hitching women's status to the nation has two significant results. It created a legitimate opening for women to pursue formal education and careers outside the home and for them to participate in public affairs and politics. But it also, to some extent, distorted history, as if women before the end of the 19th century had left no mark in Chinese tradition altogether. So a brief review of the historical, uh, here's Liang Qita, a brief review of the uh, historical records of much of 19th century Chinese women. For indeed, there are records, though for a long time, these records were not very well known. Unearthed in the last couple of decades, we have clear evidence that there was a vibrant tradition of women as writers, teachers, artists, scholars, and scientists. Yes, mathematicians and astronomists. Most of these women were born into the literati class and privately educated by family members and hired tutors. Their highest achievements were made in literature, especially poetry. Throughout Chinese history, there have been many women writers, but there were high tides where we don't just have uh, many, we have thousands. So the first half of the 19th century saw one of the major high tides. We know of mothers and aunts teaching daughters and nieces and generations of women forming basically literary clubs. And we know of uh, friendships among women, including Manchu women and Han women. They were um, almost uh, pen pals in that Many women had to be at uh, very far physical distances from one another because of their husband's uh, jobs. So they would be writing to one another, composing poetry, and we have records of that. So for example, uh, Wan Yanyun Zhu in 1831, and uh, I didn't list it on the slide, but her granddaughter five years later, the two of them published two anthologies which showcased the works of 4,000 plus women poets. Uh, Shen Shanbao listed here uh, is also noted for her self-conscious project of canon building. She basically wrote a book collecting women poets and building that tradition, critiquing that position. Her friend, uh, the Manchu poet Gu Taiqing was the first woman novelist we wouldn't have known she was a novelist because the novel was published anonymously, except for Shen's preface that left clues. Uh, these clues were only found a couple of decades ago, even though the novel was, pu uh, was published uh, more than a hundred years ago. So a few points to note about this long women's literature. That one 
um, it is a long tradition and that um, the preservation was quite difficult because uh, not only many works were not preserved, they were intentionally destroyed. Um, there was the dramatic trope and actual act of uh, women flinging their poems into the flame. So that what is preserved is probably only a fraction of what was produced. Another point to note is that there was a vast network, familial and non-familial, among women writers who supported one another. A third point to note, uh, this is the last point to note, that in this poetic tradition, women sometimes would adopt what is known as the heroic style, hao fang, so typically in a male voice, this is a kind of literary cross-dressing that is especially relevant during large scale uh, crises such as wars and dynastic transition. So now I move on to the end of the dynasty. Uh, you can see in around 1850, things really changed. This high tide um, essentially stopped. So there were two major historical factors that shook the foundation of the Qing dynasty and precipitated uh, radical changes. One is the Taiping Rebellion of the 1850s and 60s, as mentioned in Professor Lovell's introduction. This rebellion laid to waste large swath of the country, especially hard hit was the Yangtze Delta region, the heart of female learning. The decline of the empire, this is the second factor, was quickened by the incursion of Western imperial powers, beginning with the Opium War and culminating in the 1900 Boxers incident, when the allied troops drove out the imperial court and occupied the capital, Beijing, for a year and almost a year and a half. So by 1900, the Empress Dowager, Cixi had helped held power of regency for more than 30 years. Two years earlier in 1898, she had suppressed the 100 day reform, put the emperor essentially under house arrest and executed the leading reformers. You've just seen them in Professor Ma's presentation. So in past histories and popular imagination, she had generally been portrayed as a dragon lady and usurper of male power and resistant to modernization. Recent scholarship, however, shows that she has a much more complex legacy. For example, in the last years of her regency, together with other policies of reform, she promoted women's arts and crafts and endorsed women's education, which had a major impact. Recall the reformers such as Liang Qichao had been calling for women's education, while formal education for women began quite late in 1844. In fact, it really had just one school and for about 20 years, hardly anything much happened. By the time Cixi died, the Empress Dowager died in 1908, there were more than 500 women's schools with more than 20,000 students. In the last decade of the Qing, of the 19th century, there were many women who were active in public affairs. I'll just give a few sketches as examples of their amazing lives. One person, Xue Shaohui, participated in the 100-day reform movement. She was in Shanghai promoting women's schools. When the reform failed, she edited newspapers, including the first feminist journal, um, pretty clearly a feminist journal, however we define the term. Um, she collaborated with her husband, uh, who uh, for many years was a diplomat, and they translated and compiled uh, a number of Western literary, historical, and scientific books. The second figure on uh, the slide, Hui Xing, is a Manchu educator who single-handedly opened a middle school for women when funding became difficult and it often became difficult for those new schools. Um, she petitioned the government and society. When those efforts failed, she made a final plea and took her own life. The news of which was so widely disseminated 
funds poured in and her school survived. The third figure on the picture, there are two of them. So the taller woman is by the name of Ida Khan or Kang Aide, was touted by the young reformer Liang Qichao as China's first new woman and written up in missionary petitions as a Confucian descendant. She was brought up by an American missionary woman, educated at the University of Michigan and ran a missionary hospital for many years in Jiujiang, China. The last figure on my slide, Lu Bicheng, began as a literati daughter, much like the many women who wrote in the long 19th century, except that she did this unusual thing. She published a poem in a newspaper in 1904. This was pretty much unheard of at the time. Women's poetry were very rarely published in uh, public media. You might get public, uh, privately published in a volume that's already somewhat controversial, but to get it published in a newspaper, uh, hers was one of the very first. And she was promptly recruited to become the editor of that newspaper for the next four years. This was also a position that no women had held before um, for a major newspaper. So working after working in newspaper and education for a number of years in the early 20th century, she traveled widely in US and Europe. So I'll end with uh, perhaps the most famous female figure at the end of the long 19th century, Qiu Jin. Her first 30 years resembled the typical life of a literati daughter before her. So well-educated in Chinese history and literature, she wrote poems with her family, her sisters, her friends. She married by arranged marriage and had two children. This is perfectly uh, typical of her class background and of the past several hundred years. But this placid figure you see in the photograph of Qiu Jin um, was not everything that there is. At the same time, she was writing poems like this. This is a, an excerpt of a longer poem. Alas, they send me off by force to be mere rouge and powder, meaning to be women, to be a woman. How I despise it. My body will not allow me to mingle with the man, but my heart is far braver than that of a man. She clearly wanted her life to play out on a larger stage than the domestic sphere. So in the late Qing, that larger stage was national salvation, made urgent by the continuous threat of China's partition by Western imperial powers. In 1903, she adopted her style name, Swordswoman of Mirror Lake, in response to the call for volunteers to fight the Russian occupation of Manchuria. Although she didn't in fact go to the front, the national crisis precipitated a process of remaking herself and more generally, a reconceptualization of women's role in history. About the same time, she began to cross-dress as captured by this photograph. This is probably 1902. When questioned, she said, I want to become strong like men. First, I want to look like a man in appearance, and then I will become like a man in, in my psyche. Now, this may sound naive, and it did sound naive to her Japanese interlocutor who asked her why she was cross-dressing. But knowing how women dressed at the time, including with bound feet, and which uh, significantly conditioned how you move your body and what you think you can or cannot do, this idea of changing the dress and then affecting how you carry yourself, affecting how you think of yourself, is not nearly as naive as people thought at the time. Between 1904 and 1905, Qiu Jin went to Japan to study. There were a good number of women students at the time, uh, but her situation was quite unusual. There were about 10,000 Chinese students in Japan at the time. It was a major surge within just a few years. Uh, about 100 are women 
But she was unusual in that she wasn't going with a family member, not a father, not a mother, not uh, brothers, as some of the women did. She was going alone, having left behind her family and her two children. She studied Japanese, translated a nursing manual. Um, Florence Nightingale was very big in China at the time. Uh, she also joined secret societies to overthrow the empire. In this other photograph on the right, you see her in a Japanese uh, school outfit, uh, basically uh, taking a picture of herself as an anarchist assassin. After she came back to China, she taught at a women's school, ran a feminist journal, was involved in organizing military uprising against the Qing Empire. Here's one more photograph and a poem. Who could this person be looking so sternly ahead? The martial bones I bring from a former existence regret the flesh that covers them. The physical form that I now inhabit inhabit is but a phantom, but the world that has yet to emerge, that might be real. In 1907, Qiu Jin uh, was implicated in one uprising, was caught by King, uh, Qing soldiers and executed by beheading. To the very end, she continued to compose poetry her last words committed to memory by later generations. And this I checked with friends in China and in Taiwan. We all know her last words. Qiu Jing's death, even more than her life, galvanized many people and the empire fell four years later. Her life did play out on the grand stage of national transformation, much as she had wished for. So, um, to conclude, what we see in women's education and women's uh, participation in national affairs is that there is a tradition, traditional link to past women writers. Women wrote about participating in public affairs in the past. They were less able to do so, but with um, the reformist concept of linking women's status and women's participation with the nation, there was a significant opening and things really did change. So Chiu Jin did not write, just write about participating in uh, national affairs in the grand unfolding of history. She did participate and made a significant contribution and she was not the only one. I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Hu Ying, and thank you to you both for those very stimulating and informative presentations, uh, both of which raise key th themes in late imperial Chinese history. Um, and many questions suggested themselves to me as I listened. Um, could I start with a rather big question for um, Professor Ma? Um, I think you've contributed importantly to debates about the Great Divergence. Um, this is a historical debate that explores how, when and why the Chinese Empire lost its long-held position of global equality or even dominance in terms of science, technology and living standards and got overtaken by um, ambitious, aggressive Western nations. Um, now, a, a, a well-known book by the American Sinologist uh, Kenneth Pomerantz puts the great divergence um, at about 1800, so up to that point, if I've not misunderstood the arguments, uh, suggests that um, the richest parts of Qing China, sort of living standards, productivity, uh, commercialization, held up pretty much with the richest part of Northern Europe, um, industrializing Britain, but after that, uh, a, a, a divergence takes place. It's been a lot of historical debate about these sets of ideas. Um, so I wanted to ask Professor Ma, when would you, ident do you see a great divergence as taking place in this period? If so, 
when would you identify it as taking place and how do you evaluate the measures put in place by um, uh, uh, individuals living in the Qing Empire in the 19th century? How do you evaluate those measures put in place to overcome this sense of technological or scientific gap with Western countries? Well, thank you, Professor Level. You're asking important, a, a big question. <laughs> so we are going back to a topic that's been probably in debate now for at least two or three decades, and that involved um, in not, not just scholars on China, but on certainly on the European side as well. Um, so I, at one point, I, you know, have been working on the quantitative side. Uh, I didn't, you know, today I only cited very traditional statistics on the per capita GDP. Some of it is, you know, I didn't even use the most updated statistics and, and all of that. Um, I think there are several contributions that really matter. One of the things to think about China, because China was so big, so it's actually good to focus on the regions. And the region was interesting. Uh, the richest region is the Lower Yangtze region. And today, the, the part that I talk about, Shanghai, is precisely in the center of this, except there's one very big difference, is that the Shanghai itself is relatively marginal with Suzhou, and the whole area was much important. But in the more modern time, Shanghai became a completely uh, different city, uh, you know, uh, uh, played a very, very different role. Now, it's a very complicated issue. I think maybe probably I, people are still debating it. I personally think that probably China fell behind much earlier. Um, the, you know, some of the data I've done on wages that showing China was only about a third of the UK by the 18th century. This is unskilled laborers' wages and so on. Uh, this was conforms for, for more the, to the traditional view. Um, I think one thing that came out was quite important. I, 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 Professor Lover, you're risking asking <laughs> to take me, having me take all the time now. Uh, but one thing I think that was quite important that people uh, talked about is uh, in terms of institutions, property rights, in some sense, China could be quite advanced. It's not as what we think about. That's something that's very, very important. Uh, there's not the kind of, you know, everyday repression that we think about. Uh, tax rates were, were relatively low. There's a lot of freedom. There's certain contract that people, it's a very, very commercial oriented society wherever it allows. And that's, that's I think that definitely no problem with that. I think the thing that was very important, I just want to mention two things that when you look into 19th century, 20th century, that's where it become much more interesting. The 18th century was a vast but there are major problems in the 18th century, particularly ideology. There's massive censorship. We all know that Qianlong Emperor has Siku Quanshu, but completely steeped in traditional classics. Um, so it really took an opening of a completely different opening. And Japan presented this wonderful example of once you began to open yourself up, taking the Western ideology, internalized them, that began to play a very, very big, important role. I should really stop <laughs> uh, on, on this part. Well, thank you very much for packing so much into that answer. Very, very huge topic. So I'm really grateful to you for taking that on. Um, a co historically comparative question also for Professor Hu Ying. Um, thank you for that extremely moving account of the changing lives of women across China's long 19th century. Now, historians of Chinese feminism, um, who generally have seen it as a, a sort of modern late 19th, 20th, 21st century phenomenon, they've often underlined the importance of the 1920s as the moment at which China's mass political parties, the Chinese Communist Party and the Kuomintang, uh, the GMD, this is the moment at which these big, these new political parties try to mobilize women, bring women into national revolutionary politics. But this mobilization um, actually comes at a certain cost to the emancipation platforms of women revolutionaries. So radical women are often told by male political leaders that they have to forget about fighting for women's rights and instead help promote the national party-led revolution, which, surprise, is run mainly by men. So sort of comparing this other decade, the 1920s, which is seen as so important for the emergence of um, Chinese political feminism, how would you rate comparatively the late 
Ching, actually, the 1890s, first decade of the 20th century, as a period of um, political, social, cultural possibility for Chinese women relative to the 1920s. You know, is this a moment of possibility that 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 needs to be highly rated relative to the perhaps the the narrowing of political possibility in the 1920s and 1930s yeah that is a really good question um i studied the late Qing, so i i you know uh, i'm inclined to think late Qing was a a, a a time of great foment uh lots of possibilities in part because people could feel the radical changes coming, but we're not sure where the changes were going. So um, you read the writers' moments, so they, they would be very enthusiastic, think uh, a new world is uh, breaking. On the other hand, uh, there are other moments, the very same writers would write as if the world was ending, uh, that it was not clear. And so therefore, um, possibilities were uh, many, in terms of uh, women, the uh, hitching of women's uh, equality, education, uh, freedom to the nation already began in the late teens. Um, you could say that um, without that link, there would have been far less opening for women to par participate, to even seek formal education. So whether a person, an individual, was seeking education just for personal um, interests, uh, they could always use the larger umbrella of bettering the nation, strengthening the nation. So therefore, women should be uh, educated and become better citizens or mothers of citizens. So that was a... Uh, a a really major advantage for women. On the other hand, it was clearly a double-sided sword. And that became much more obvious in the 20s and, and into the 30s and 40s when uh, in the Pacific theater, when the war started, then um, women's liberation or uh, gender equality very much became a secondary concern that if you were not to devote your life to uh, national salvation, um, and if you were seeking just women's uh, interests, you would be considered uh, not truly a new woman. In fact, people made such arguments using Qiu Jin as an example to say, look, Qiu Jin was a real new woman because she fought for national salvation and not for personal interest which was not true. She really was very interested in having equal rights for women on all fronts, not just political. Thank you very much, um, Ku Ying, and, and thank you again to our two speakers for wonderful presentations, which uh, suggest and open out so many further lines of inquiry. Uh, thank you also to the audience for joining us uh, for this event. And please check out other events connected with uh, the exhibition China's Hidden Century, which will appear on the British Museum website. Goodbye. <laughs>